Welcome to Access to Perspectives Conversations. Today, we have Nikki Pfeiffer in the room. Nikki Pfeiffer works with the Center for Open Science, and we've been um, communicating, collaborating for a couple of years now um, with regards to our work with Africa Archive and also in the realms of open science and um, all the beautiful products and tools and services the Center for Open Science has developed. And yeah, well, first of all, welcome, warm welcome to you, Nikki. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. It's a great pleasure. Um, so starting off, would you um, would you be willing to share some of your journey that led you to eventually work with the Center for Open Science? Like, what's your background? Um, yeah, what is your what, are, what were during the studies your research interests? What led you to open science and now um, to the Center for Open Science? Sure, happy to. I, it, I don't know that it will be as interesting as others and there may be a couple of surprises in here. Um, so actually my background is mechanical engineering. Uh, so I have a degree in mechanical engineering and I did my a lot of my research um, in materials science and nanotechnology um, and then began um, my work career uh, actually working with um, the Department of Defense with secret uh, government clearance working on radar signatures. Um, to support the global war on terrorism after 9-11 hit the United mm. States. Uh, so that's what I was doing um, and then uh, decided to um, have a family. So I actually took 12 years and wasn't working um, or doing research, but actually uh, the most important work of having, having a family and, and raising up kiddos. Uh, but once they were older, I have three uh, now teenagers, um, once they were old enough to, to be in school and didn't need me, I decided I needed to go back uh, for my own self-fulfillment to day-to-day to, to -day work life. Um, and I couldn't sit still even then. Um, I did things like volunteering um, for church kitchen and um, making meals president of their PTO at their school, the parent teacher mm. organization to help support the teachers that are teaching um, all the wonderful, wonderful kiddos um, and basically any other uh, sort of volunteer work I could do in my community. So, um, but ultimately I decided I'd, I'd go back to work and I found um, the role at the Center for Open Science early, early on. Uh, they had only been in existence for uh, a year or two and had just uh, been developing the OSF with a small group of developers, but didn't have any QA testing yet. Um, we only had a few hundred or so users on the platform, so it wasn't a big deal, um, but things were starting to ramp up. Um, they got some funding and they were starting to add features and, and more users were coming, so they wanted to have um, quality assurance testing. So uh, I joined the center as a part-time intern Mm -hmm. doing QA testing um, and developed processes and ultimately added members to the team um, and integrated that in with um, now our, you know, our pretty robust platform um, that absolutely there is, is tremendous efforts on QA testing with every release we push because we have over 450,000 users now. Mm -hmm. um, so obviously having bugs or defects go, <clears throat> go out would not would not be okay. Um, but that is how I started um, at COS over seven years ago now, again, as an intern, mm -hmm. just moved into product management and now into the role of chief product officer. Great. Um, and then since you mentioned 9-11 and then the role you took with the national defense, is that it? Um, mm -hmm. was that, what, were you personally affected? Was your family affected by the attacks? <laughs> Uh, no, I didn't lose anyone uh, that I knew or that um, was in my family during mm. that. It just, it changed the way of it, life yeah, here in the United the States. Yeah, yeah, so. yeah, it definitely changed things mm. and something that, um, you know, I just had passion to, to help, um, yeah, to help right. solve and, and, and make sure that everyone was safe across the world, really, because U.S. has such a presence in the, in the whole world around mm. um, security and and safety so and thinking back now like the work you did then and there for that purpose and now 
the work that you've like that you did studying at the Center for Open Science and what you're doing now, like when it comes to talk about talking about career development and transferable skills, was there anything in particular that you find you could apply to the new job, the new setting? Anything that stuck out? Um, I mean, there's a there's a few things. I mean, I think some of it is just an engineering mindset for for problem solving and <clears throat> incrementalism and and process. I mean, I feel like those are things that um, I, I started out my career. Definitely part of the work I did um, with um, the. Department of Defense and now obviously expanded in this role. Um, just, you know, just several key elements. Um, actually, what I would consider some of our core principles at COS, um, just to build tools or workflows that support um, here in this case researchers, but even when my role was to serve the service men and women that were overseas fighting in the war, um, basically meet them where they are. So whatever place you're at, finding the answer that helps you now versus where where do we really want to be, mm -hmm. um, just delivering to that ideal state doesn't help the people that are trying to make a difference now. Um, and then being really inclusive um, to all communities. I mean, that's something we're doing at COS with OSF, but that's also the case when you're providing intelligence for the government, because um, again, we have lots of allies across the world. So, you know, just even thinking about what, what tools or sophisticated instrumentation they may or may not have, making sure that it's something that supports anyone um, who might need this, this, this intelligence, essentially. Mm -hmm. um, and then to add efficiency and, and not burden. Um, so again, just thinking about how things are delivered in a way that um, you have everything you need to, to interpret it and understand it, um, that intelligence, but also the same thing um, with the tools for, for researchers and practicing open science, um, just to make it more efficient, less repeated steps and, and duplicated efforts uh, along the way, I think really mm. help, help it be meaningful and useful. Yeah, I, yeah totally. Uh, Wait, um, I had a, what was the question now? Um, okay, yeah, I think we mentioned also the, uh, the open science framework that's basically the, is it still a core product of the CS of the center? Yes. Um, so should we maybe explain briefly what it does and how it's of service to the, to a now a global research community? Um, it's basically, it's, it's an archive and also more than that it's for documenting the whole research workflow. And that's like um, going beyond the mere archiving of data and, and uh, manuscripts. So how, like what's the added value as compared to other repositories? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a, a number of great repositories out there <clears throat> and really COS is not in it for a you know, competitive advantage or to be the, the one. We, we're we providing a tool that helps practice open, open science, um, but we actually advocate for lots of other solutions as well because ultimately it's our mission and we wanna see um, science be open. And so wherever you do it, however you do it, we're excited mm -hmm. and championing that effort versus our own. Um, but there was a point where there weren't a lot of solutions out there um, and we do feel like there are a couple of unique things um, that are part of how OSF supports the, those, those open practices. Um, so one, it's open source, which means that you can see the code, you can see the changes, you know what we're doing, um, we're not hiding it, and you can always pull out whatever uh, you put into it at any point, so you're not locked in. Um, we also have... Um, a small community, and we really like to um, grow this community of uh, developers. So open source developers that have contributed back to what we offer with OSF, which means that th there's extensions and additional capabilities and ways to work with the OSF programmatically that support researcher goals across just the large number of communities that could really leverage it for their needs. Um, but it is a collaborative management tool is essentially how we describe it, but it supports mm -hmm. 
um, the workflows across the research life cycle. So really thinking about the different phases of research and I'll summarize them, there's many and um, they're different depending on how you practice your research. But in general, there's a lot of effort in planning and collaboration. Um, and one of the things that OSF provides is a step for pre-registration or really sort of that pre-commitment to what you're planning as, far, as part of your, your research question or your hypothesis, how you're gonna conduct your study um, before you begin collecting the data and really how you're going to even analyze that data before you begin the process. Um, so mm. that's one part of the OSF um, that is that is part, you know, supporting the, the entire research life cycle. But as you collaborate, you can um, you can be open um, with just your collaborative your collaborative research team, um, or you can keep that stuff private until it's time to share more broadly, depending on the nature of your work. And we understand that. So there's definitely not this all or nothing open science mantra going on. There are times and and reasons why you wouldn't necessarily do everything in the open um, at, at every point. Although. Yeah you know, if you can, then that's obviously um, something we, we would encourage. Mm -hmm. But there are use cases where um, initially you wanna work together with your research team, define all these things, and then you could create this pre-registration. You can even embargo it for some time um, if it's important to keep that um, uh, to yourselves until the research, uh, a later stage where you're ready to disseminate your research. Mm -hmm. um, so then the data collection and all of those things happen uh, on a number of different platforms. And that's something, again, we don't, we don't support, uh, we don't not support doing that at, at the right, at the, at the best tool for you. Um, but what we try to do is integrate. Um, so like I said, we have a open source and we have a public API and we've integrated with several tools. I think the number is 11 at this point, but we're always interested in having conversations with other uh, tool makers or communities that say this tool really is necessary for me to conduct my research and I'd love to have it part of how the OSF ecosystem works. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of times it can happen without um, incurring the maintenance and sustainability cost of that um, direct integration. And it's something most of the time you can just use the API to meet your needs, but that's always a conversation we'd love to have with, um, with communities. And then um, beyond that, you know, there's sort of the reporting. Once you finish your study, there's the need to really report out your findings. Um, and if you pre-registered, it's really um, critical to actually say, this is what I said I was gonna do. And, and that is what I did, or actually, real life happened and these things are actually what happened, um, but to share that transparently and then to share all of the outputs of your research um, so that they're linked together, they have Ooh. DOIs, they're archived and there's something that if I um, find your data in a in a in an article, if I wanna follow that back and trace to some of the other aspects of the data dictionary or the protocol that went into that study, all of those pieces can be connected using the OSF um, and connect those tool, the tools or the outputs together that helped create that. Um, and then finally discovery, like that's really important is fair, um, fair implementation of all of the steps in the research process um, and making sure that those things are discoverable with good metadata mm -hmm. um, and then can be reused and built on um, and yeah. even the traceability of, of those steps as well. Like really thinking of like te technologically um, is really embracing the full concept of open science with open methodology, open like pre-registration as you pointed out, um, which is, not often mentioned when it comes to open science, but it's increasingly so. I always much, um, stress it in the trainings that I do, um, like to encourage researchers to pre-register their plant research. Um, and I feel like I feel we need again or still a mindset shift because a lot of the early career researchers feel they're failing when they have to change their route and how the workflow goes from the hypothesis and research idea they set out on um, and how that's changing along the process. Um, but yeah, is there, did, did you receive feedback from the users who embraced or who adopted pre-registration and actually um, locked those and probably also assigned UIs, which is again, also to mark the research idea in the first place and therefore basically have the not a priority of discovery but a priority of thoughtfulness about a research question um was there is there some learning that you can share from the users 
to the listeners that you yeah. collected in the center? Yeah, absolutely. Um, this is a really um, great question to ask and, and something that we've act, we've spent quite a bit of time focusing in on because we, we do understand that pre-registration is, um, is a change. It's something new that maybe not all disciplines are practicing. Um, and it feels a little bit tight, like claustrophobic. Like once you put that down, um, the reality of your research will then, you know, make it seem like you, you didn't, go about this in the best way or, or whatever the case may be. Um, there's a But number of reasons. Wouldn't it be good to assume the changes will come? Like exactly. interruption will happen. I mean, this exactly. is research. That's the nature of research. We're at the brink of knowledge. Right, right. No, that's exactly, uh, that's exactly right. And um, so, so we've heard this over the, over the years, mostly in the form of researchers who have used OSF to create their pre-registration. And once you do that, it's this immutable time-stamped version of, of what you said your research plan was. And there wasn't a good way to make updates to that or make changes to that. And so what we used to have them do was to create a new one. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes this, obviously, if you started data collection, you shouldn't be updating your study plan. But oftentimes this is happening like, oh, I had a typo. I said I would collect 15 samples instead of 150. I need to go in and like make this right. Mm -hmm. um, or, or things about a live, you know, in-person data collection and then COVID hit. And like, now I have to do all these course, interviews yeah. virtually or whatever the case may be for their mm -hmm. study. Um, and so wanting to like make those updates and make it correct and accurate. Um, so so what, we, what we did was actually implement a new feature where um, you could make an update to your, to your registration, to your pre-registration. So um, it still creates like the time stamped uh, and, and, and you have to kind of say what you're changing and why you're changing it at this point. Mm -hmm. um, and it does try to, at some point we'll iterate on this and, and ask, you know, have you started data collection? Because if that's the case, then really there shouldn't be changes um, to certain parts of your pre-registered plan, but there could be metadata changes and things like that, that make sense, like mm -hmm. really for discoverability or accuracy that those parts aren't, aren't part of the study design substance. Um, so those were, those were uh, changes we actually just rolled out the end of last year. We've had tremendous you know, feedback that this has been really helpful. Um, mm -hmm. And honestly, when you look at the scholarly record, it's a way cleaner way of keeping track of you know, the changes to, their, to the research over time. Withdrawing something and then creating a new one and trying to link between the two mm -hmm. wasn't actually the right approach. So we've, we've made improvements on that front too. So that's not, that doesn't create a whole new version of a document, just like changes within the same document, which are right. then earmarked in one way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's just updates to the original that have a timestamp and a, and yeah. a justification for it, but ultimately right. it's the same pre-registration. Do people assign, or do, can, can you assign DOIs to the pre pre-registration? Mm -hmm. So that's then also like a scholarly record that you can yeah. use in your CV. Exactly. And actually, we've been working with DataCite um, to get an update to their schema so that um, pre-registrations are actually an object type. Right now, they kind of get folded into the other category, yeah. which means when we want to trace these as part of sort of the PID graph or, or the, you know, the way that the research gets done, we're just tucking them into other, but they're a really critical stage mm -hmm. of research and rigor and transparency when you say, this is what I'm setting out to do and at the end of it here's what I did and here's what I found so that we can build on that over time um, yeah. and it allows for so many learnings also expectation management for one or the other PI like how much can you really achieve within three or five years of the PhD and then also that real life happens all of the time <laughs> yeah. and, and then again like the unexpected of research I mean why wouldn't we do that otherwise Hypotheses are only assumptions and they may or may not hold true. And this is why we do the work. Okay. Yeah, um, I'm real hmm? quick on that, just to say, um, you know, I wonder, uh, and nobody knows the answer to this question, but how many times have the same researchers tried mm. 
tried to answer the same research question because we didn't share that what we're working on. And we certainly don't share the null findings, which is another issue to, to solve as well. But, you know, you could imagine when it's pre-registered and then you report out, you would share that, yeah, this didn't go where I wanted it to. I learned these things, but I didn't answer this question. So next, so, you know, somebody could work from, from that point yeah. uh, onward, or you yourself could, but just um, making all of that much more transparent, I think, would just help us all not duplicate the effort. Um, Absolutely. This would we'll so, save so much money, but also, like, um much less frustration for so like hundreds and thousands and tens of thousands of PhD students because right. I learned throughout my PhD journey I learned that I like I don't know the repetitiveness of molecular biology work and then just imagining okay how many other people are doing the same thing just in this building <laughs> and then around the world seriously yeah and then right wouldn't it have, have been better to collaborate <laughs> you know uh -huh. to to share data and to to build on each other's work um, in a new yeah. way. So I think I think there's a lot of promise to to being transparent in this way and what we could all benefit from. So, you know, putting your your own work in to this ecosystem in this way, and then what you could actually get out as value um, is just a new paradigm that we haven't really explored. Um, so I think it's exciting to start to see this taking 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 you know, shape. Take, also, yeah, yeah. Like, I think, like, many people are, are realizing the issue, but there's only a few who actually have the capacity and the knowledge and, the, like, the technology to, to, yeah, to build the tools to actually deliver, like, the OSF. Right. I think tools are a big piece of it. I also think some of the incentives are, are the other challenge um, that gets in the way um, mm. of, of, of practicing research this way. Um, so yeah we have another episode coming up um where we talk about values aligned research and and of course transparency which is provided by sharing the pre-registration is a key component um yeah we need all of that and then as if dora is doing its part but it's it's surprising like for us who work in the open science ecosystem like at the core of it, it seems like and i don't know how many people we are maybe a couple of hundreds and <laughs> And then there's so many others out there who have not heard about the San Francisco Declaration of, what is it? Open, no, of research assessment. Mm -hmm. um, what's coming? I mean, there's a lot of signatories. The other question is then, how is it going to be implemented institution-wise? Progress. Progress is being made and we yeah. keep pushing. <laughs> No, it is. It's exciting to see that um, for sure. So, yeah. so not saying we're not we're not making that progress. I think yeah. it's definitely happening, but we're not. We don't want to stop either. I think there's further to go. And now, for the nature of um, talking about the global research community and your experience of working in the Center for Open Science, how have how are you experiencing um, the tools and so and and products? That are being developed, being picked up around the globe, and how how do you see like like I like the term um, or I keep using the term global research equity, like because I have a firm belief that if all of us would increasingly or like fully embrace and practice open science, meaning transparent, good research practices throughout. Um, then we could, and within a decade of years, really could achieve research equity around the world. And I think like really the Center for Open Science and towards like the OSF are contributing and facilitating that. Do you, do you also see that from inside? And also the conversations we keep having in consortia of all kinds of sorts. Yeah, no, I definitely think pro yeah, progress is happening. There's there's global use of tools like OSF um, for practicing open science, which is fantastic to see. I'm 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 usually more critical when it's when it's my own work, and so I'll just I'll just be critical about areas I want to keep advancing. Um, obviously, language and translation barriers still exist, and I think that that is going to get in the way if we don't start to solve for that. 
um, and, and, and access, right? So OSF is free for researchers. It's, it's a tool that anybody can log in and discover what's in it without having an account, um, but then also can create a very simple free account and start sharing their research publicly. So I think um, in that way, we've, we've certainly re eliminated a barrier, right? Um, but then I think, you know, being able to um, translate and, 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 and know that the data protections and things are applied in the right ways for the content that researchers mm. are applying. I think those are the areas that still need to keep evolving to support this global sort of equity that you're speaking of and something we certainly are, are constantly working on. Um, but, you know, I think licensing and um, again, some of the data protection work um, still, I think it's just, it's a place we're still going to need to spend some time yeah. in understanding. I know we together have been working to try to solve for um, storage on the continent of Africa for data and, and researchers to use. And that's been tricky. It's been, it's yeah. actually been, um, it sounds like it should be an easy thing to solve, but we've had um, a harder time really finding the resources and the, and the partner organizations who have the mandate for the whole continent in this case. Right. Yeah. And so I think those are those are still the challenges that we're going to have to continue to work through. And, and that's not that, that's one location just because it's the one that we're working together on. But there are many other locations that have similar challenges. I know that um, we work with some institutional partners in Canada and they have um, they have their own restrictions um, for the country, but then they have provincial and tribal um, you know, restrictions about that data. And, you know, it's it's not to say that that technology can't support them, but we haven't worked through how. So how we actually devise systems that meet those res restrictions and requirements in a way that still creates access and discoverability, but mm. protects at the same time. Those are still things that um, the technology hasn't quite solved for. Mm -hmm. um, I, I know that it can, we just haven't, um, we yeah. haven't solved it yet. And so those are things that I think um, still need, still need some time and effort what? to finish up. Yeah, but you mentioned tribal in the Canadian context. Are you talking about First Nations? Or... That that's exactly what um, we are looking at um, okay. as so, as where it's been coming forward. Um, different. So, with the Indigenous community um, understanding of ownership of data, basically referring to the care principle, mm -hmm. which is more values based and less individual. Um, more community and reuse in a way that it's that the information is not being misappropriated. Is it? Yes, that that's. And then, um, what legal means are there to protect the data and to right. ensure ownership? Right, and there's a lot mm. of different roles in there that we don't really see um, in the technology yet that that I've come across um, in ways that you can assign those protections and those those roles of of sort of compliance to make sure that um, it's not um, violated. Uh, so I think that those are important, but I haven't seen I know that OSF yet hasn't, but we, we were working with mm. Canadian partners to try to solve for this and, and work through how the technology could support it. But yeah, it's very, very simple things of, you know, start with the easy part of like where the data and the metadata is stored. Um, and so we've worked through a little bit of that solution, but then it's beyond that on individual data sets and, and, the, and the sharing and reuse. Yeah. Um, I, I like we had we had an episode with Rory Hark, the former director of Orchid, and she's been working on a project called Local Contacts, which was is also investigating these challenges or yeah, I don't know, challenges in a yeah technology wise. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm trying yeah trying to phrase it positively, but our remaining challenges, yeah. Um, so also on that end, I think progress is being made, but it needs to be um, and it, it needs to be assessed on yeah, not only country level, but really tribal level if it works for that particular community that's concerned and how the exchange between the researchers, the academics and the, the tribal communities occurs to what extent and yeah. Um, okay. 
well, it's yeah, that's really a lot to consider for um, quite a lot of exciting and also challenging, but positively challenging. And uh, yeah, it's it's good to to realize that we we actually do make progress, and there's lots of learnings to be made across organizations and in the also applying. I feel like we are applying the fair principles. We mentioned it fair a few times in this episode without really um, explaining back what it means to listeners who might come in um, new, but we've covered it in previous episodes. So fair as in findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable when it comes to research data. But um, I feel it's also applicable, or I think we can agree that it's applicable also to research manuscripts and also broader contexts. Uh, con- Con- context, concepts and con- yeah, concepts in the sense. Um, yeah, in, in the sense of interoperability and technology wise, where you said that the Center for Open Science is, is keen on um, also by developing APIs to make OSF and other systems interoperable, interoperable with other service providers and research management tools, um, which for me as a biologist makes a lot of sense and maybe also for you um, with your backgrounds in mechanics and engineering um, that diversity is really the key to success and progress and fairness in the double meaning of it (laughs) so yeah we're on a good route okay um Maybe coming to an end for the episode, what, what's your, or what, what I also wanted, because we started off um, referring back to 9-11 and now um, we have some um, tempting or also challenging times, pol- politic, poli- what's the word, um, political wise in with the war in Ukraine, between Ukraine and Russia. And I mean, there's also other wars and conflicts around the world, how do you have have you observed um, ha, has these occurrences or these uh, has the war in Russia and Ukraine affected any of the I mean not the operations of the Center for Open Science or the OSF itself, but um, did you see a change in use usage from Ukraine and Russia? due to the conflict or um, has there been any other effects recently? Uh, no, that? I mean, I, it, we haven't seen dramatic changes um, in usage, but I, and, and I would say that that wasn't really a primary area that we had had activity, um, but would love to. What was what did come from it that um, I thought was was a really beautiful thing to see was this need to solve for a distributed system where things that are currently, you know, archived in Ukraine face risk of of damage and being lost kind of forever from the scholarly Mm. record to be uploaded digitally and to make sure it was on a distributed system that if one, you know, server didn't exist anymore and that's the only place it was stored, Mm -hmm. then we wouldn't have it any longer. Um, And I saw lots of groups um, kind of jump in to to offer their platforms and their services to help, you know, create this mitigation that Mm. was really dire. Um, And and we, of course, offered that as well and, and would, you know, want to make sure that that is the case, not just for Ukraine, but across the world um, mm-hmm. where there could be risks or that we're, we're not supporting um, that interoperable and sort of distributed systems that, you know, certainly exist, but not, not to say that everyone is taking advantage of that in a meaningful way, but what could be, um, you know, really the, the ideal state of all the, the research out there, right? That that would, mm-hmm. it can't be lost. It, it can't, it can't go away just because someone removes it here or there. Um, but that it would be preserved forever. Yeah. Um, and yeah, oh, it's too many questions in my head now to to focus. Um, okay. Yeah, but that's that's that was also my immediate concern. Like now that uh, some of the universities are got attacked, like what happens with the 
with the archiving system. Similar when in Cape Town, parts of the libraries at UCT burned due to um, uh, out of control campfire. Um, there was still a lot that had not been digitized and wouldn't be good to have digital copies at least for any events, like any of these tragic events, which sooner or later might, well, will happen, you know, never know where. And then at least we have um, digital backups. Right, but even those digital backups, if they're not in cloud, you know, yeah. distributed cloud systems and they're they just still... local, that, that, that same thing can... Mm -hmm essentially happen so you know it's it's one is definitely digital um, is an improvement but I think a further improvement is to is to come out with cloud and distributed systems so so we don't ever have the that risk um, for for the work that that we're all you know working hard to produce and invested mm -hmm. in um, and can reuse and build on so that's the, the real problem I think Research needs to detach more from politics so that also sanctions wouldn't um, affect storage necessarily. Because like legally sanctions, as far as I understand, researchers in sanctioned countries are not allowed to make use of cloud services that are hosted in the sanctioning countries. So that's uh, a bugger. Right. No, I, I would agree with you there that yeah. there's just some things that should should not be part of that. Um, and then where to draw the line? Like, yeah, we also had um, at the onset of the war, we had like two, three discussions around that episodes. And it's, yeah, you think it's easy, but then when you get into the details, it's really tricky. <laughs> okay. But yeah, let's let's focus on, I mean, the majority is, is so collaborative and interoperable and, um, not affected by by one conflict so can focus on making keeping making progress there and yeah um thank you so much for your time and for sharing your your experiences and some of your journey um maybe uh two three words or sentences of what's lying ahead it's laying ahead um yeah, thanks for having me, of course, and I am anxious to listen to one that you mentioned uh, upcoming on uh, values aligned research, so I, I'll actually be continuing to, to keep in touch to, to hear how that one goes and to listen to following uh, podcasts that you produce. Um, I, I, I think one thing that um, you've said in, in, in our conversation that just sticks with me, so maybe this is the the final point to make is how diversity is key. Again, I think yeah. diversity really helps us make the progress we're, we're, we're trying to make. So I would just end it on that note. Yeah, and it sounds so cheesy, but it's really the essence. <laughs> but yeah, and it's, I, I enjoy it every time. It's challenging sometimes. And it's also a lot of fun and big learning. Oh. Okay, so see you soon. Thank All you. right, thank you.